Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the last episode of Manage and Cutoff I'm doing live here at Space Symposium. We got Off Nominal coming up next. I'm in the middle of a four hour rock block, so I appreciate all of you hanging out. <laughs> it's been, there's been a lot of Anthony over in this section, but um, it's been a lot of fun. So we got an interesting mix of people here. Uh, I'm excited to talk about a whole range of topics, really. Honestly, whatever we get interested in talking out about, we get down rabbit holes, but it'll be really cool. We got a good cross section. I brought a ringer, Caleb Henry here. Uh, so that will be fun. Peter Beck, of course, Rocket Lab fame. Jonathan Bailiff, CFO of Redwire. Very interesting background from the biggest helicopter company uh, and all sorts of other interesting things that I've heard about. So um, what I'm interested in talking about is really the general kind of like business and strategy, uh, you know, the, the shape of that right now in the industry because it's been pretty chaotic for a couple of years. Um, there was a lot of doom and gloom of late about uh, whether it's raising money or, or really you know, closing down customers and, and figuring out, uh, everyone's kind of specializing into a different niche. Certainly a lot of news this week of Rocket Lab finding new niches to market to. Um, overall, from you know, start with Caleb because you've got such a good insight on the industry from your position at Quilty. Um, what are really like the big challenges right now that were post-COVID a couple of years, there's been a lot of, of churn in the industry between companies going out of business or startups that aren't quite raising as much money as they hoped or SPACs going a little more, uh, a little bit more redemption rate than they were hoping. Um, so what, what are, where are we at right now overall with that kind of uh, stuff in the market? Yeah, so, uh, you gotta flick it on. <laughs> it takes a second okay. until it lights up. Hello, hello. All right, cool. Um, I will try to be succinct. I don't know if it's possible <laughs> to cover the entire space industry. Tell me everything right now. Yeah, yes. how is space today? Um, you know, I, I would say, and maybe this is a little bit of like a, a I don't want to be doom and gloom, but you know, I feel like the, the space industry has, uh, people have been fearing a reckoning for some time. You look back at the beginning of the mega constellations, you had people saying, this is Iridium all over again. Investors are not going to trust the sector because it's going to fail and implode and then they'll run away. And that didn't happen. And even though OneWeb went into chapter 11, it was masked by COVID, which hit the world and the industry. And so there was no reckoning. And then there was the issue of no exits for startups. You know, there were all these startups that had raised all this money, no exits. You just had like Google and Skybox in like 2016 or something. So it was like very, very few examples to look at. And then you had the SPAC boom, something also that happened outside of the industry, but affected it. And all of a sudden you had a vehicle that allowed several investors to have their exit. Uh, concurrent with that, you had this interesting phenomena of companies that were rolling up small to medium sized enterprises like Redwire. <laughs> Uh, and they also it contributed to this consolidation. You had Redwire, you had Voyager, you had Blue Halo, all doing this that, that took a lot of the industry's woes and fears and actually kind of wiped them away. Um, so I would say that the industry has actually dodged two bullets in the past five years. Um, and now we're in you know, a, a third challenge, which is what happens to all of these newly founded or newly public companies, you know? We saw the first collapse with Virgin very recently, and there are other companies that are in difficult financial positions. Uh, I'm watching them intensely to see how they diversify, how they execute, how they make sure that space is a business and not a tech hobby. You know, I think uh, this industry, we've got so many smart people that there's often a risk of getting wrapped around the tech and trying to make a business plan later. It really should be inverted, and those that fail to do that well are going to find themselves in trouble. Certainly have someone right next to you here in Peter Beck that, um, you know, you, Rocket Lab is a launch country, company, but uh, you've taken the Rocket Lab logo as you've gotten more into the space services side. And, and you know, we, now you're public, so we see financials all the time and see how much that side of the business is generating in, in terms of revenue. And, um, you know, at the beginning, we, we talked when you were doing this series of acquisitions about the strategy behind it of, of acquiring the things that were essential to your business, um, but also finding a big customer base for that stuff. So. In terms of focus from Rocket Lab, when you go out and you talk to people that don't know about Rocket Lab, um, what emphasis do you put on each side of that business? Uh, is it a different story than you were telling five years ago, or or do you still fundamentally say, you know, we're a launch company, we have all these other things that we do as well? Yeah, I think I think it's clear that we're bad at naming stuff because I should have <laughs> never called Rocket Lab Rocket Lab because uh, that was too too short sighted. But the reality is that the very second Electron we flew had recesses in the kick stage for solar panels to turn it into a satellite. So it was kind of always the plan to, to, to do that. And, and um, 
our view is that the very large space companies of the future are space companies that have applications. They actually do things on, on orbit that, are, that, that, that generate you know, value. Um, they build their own satellites and they launch it. Because uh, when you have all of those things put together, it's, it's a very powerful combination. And, and as, as everybody is witnessing with Starlink, like a um, clear industry leader in that, in that broadband rollout. Um, and that's because you have access to space, you have the ability to build whatever spacecraft you need, and you can really conquer that application. So um, everybody thinks of us as the rocket company, but literally, like as you allude to, two thirds of our revenue comes from our space systems business. We've got 25 satellites in backlog, ranging from stuff going to Mars through to the global star constellation. Um, but launch is always going to be a really, really key thing. And it's, it is the discriminator and it is the enabler um, of a space company. You mentioned how uh, there was this trend of kind of building these companies that were wrapping up a bunch of other companies. Um, and that's what Redwire became, right? Um, it's easy for all of us to kind of latch on to what Peter's doing because it's rockets and we all like watching rockets fly into the sky. It's harder to really understand some of the more niche kind of like component supplier sort of stuff that Redwire has been involved in lately. So in terms of strategy about the collection of companies that, that make up Redwire, right, that in its current form, um, what was the strategy about the group and the mix there? And, and how does it work together today? Is it, has it changed since acquiring all them and, and it's become more of a unified whole or is it still segments of a business? I mean, it's a good question, you know, and coming from more an aerospace background where we've seen this already in the carnage of the post-1992, 93, where you saw two things happen at the same time. You saw post-Gulf War, a drawdown in the American defense budgets. At the same time, oil went crazy in the commercial airline industry. It, it never happened like that before. And you saw a number of really strong companies come out of that. Uh, one is called Transdime, and I think people know Transdime. And the nature of Transdime, especially for a space systems business, is to, in essence, bring these third and second tier providers together operationally. And that's Redwire's differentiation. Redwire is not a holding company. We're an operationally focused company, which means we're focused on revenue growth to meet customer demands. But we are very focused on creating a path to profitability, right? And that's the financial element of it. But really, the, the guts of it is to either create a revenue synergy for these small companies to be able to bid on larger projects, right, which is key. Because in essence, we provide to the primes, and then they do generally their job. We're not prime on all that much. So Redwire is a roll-up in the transdime strategy of being able to get larger projects, higher margins, but here's the key, serve that customer in a better way than a small company that doesn't have access to capital. I think the second thing is there has to be a path to profitability. I don't care if it's Amazon back in 19, I'm, I'm older than many people here, but back in the 90s, there was a path to profitability for Amazon. Now they decided to go for the beachfront property and spend a lot of investment. So really where the industry is right now is how do we balance the investments that we have to make to satisfy this demand I don't know if everybody's around here. This place is heaving. I've been, this is my third one, and it's unbelievable. This is not happening by accident. There is demand for Rocket Lab red wire services. The question is, how do we meet that demand in a way that satisfies the investors? And so for us, a business strategy was very simple. Operationally focused to meet customer demands in space systems. And then our differentiator, and that's another thing that Peter mentioned I really like, all of us have to differentiate for the investors, right? If we're all doing the same thing, we're gonna get commoditized, but we are differentiated Redwire in that we're building the office park of the future and building and enabling those missions for habitation, satellites. But the second thing is we're gonna also create the payloads for uh, habitat, for pharmaceuticals, for 3D printing in space. So we'll fill the office park too. That's our differentiator to have both of those. And then the third thing for us is we always knew we wanted to have a global business. So Redwire, as it was being founded, um, brought our Luxembourg entity in, and now we have just really expanded our European presence with Space NV. So number one, operationally focused. You can't just put a holding company together and think it's gonna succeed in aerospace or space. Second, you have to have a path of profitability to meet customer demand. And third, this, differenti um, this diversification of space systems for us, payloads, space industry, industrial work, and then finally a European arm that really can provide those carriers what we need. That's our differentiation at Redwire. On, on the Rocket Lab side, um, it's 
you know, we, you've had all these announcements this week of new suborbital hypersonic focused mission, um, which is quite interesting. Caleb and I were at the launch at Wallops uh, in January, February. I convinced him to road trip with me, so we got to experience that. So there's more of that in our backyard in the future. But um, when you are looking at a market like that, you know, I guess to tap into like, where'd you get the idea? Obviously, it's an interesting market to, to tackle, and it's very close to what you're providing already. You know, you're putting a payload in a particular t time and space. Like, that's what it is, and it just, is it orbital or not, is a different question. Um, so what's the motivation behind it and, and the strategy about the offering that you built out around it? Well, I mean, I, I love markets where you almost need to do no work to <laughs> be a, a, a player in. They're the best markets to go into. And uh, it, it occurred to both us and our government customer that you know, every sort of 20 days we're flying, you know, hypersonically. Um, so, you know, obviously in the US there's been a, a massive deficit of, of those flight opportunities and, uh, you know, with, with Electron you have all the de depressed trajectories, any, any of the smart stuff you need, you have at your fingertips. So um, it requires almost no modification to the vehicle but creates a, a, a really, a really you know, important solution and actually taps into a reasonably sized market. I mean, there's whole startup companies purely focused on just providing hypersonic test flight opportunities. Um, and you know, we, we just do it every 20 days. So we thought, well, that's an easy product. Certainly if you can keep fishing these first stages out of the ocean and just yeah. uh, slapping a new one on top, that, that matters. So you're also not off the hook from asking questions here. Why do you think I brought you here? You're a ringer. Come on. <laughs> if you, if you want. I, you take the guy out of journalism, all of a sudden he doesn't want to ask any questions. But you're... I, I was going to say, I'm actually surprised that more uh, companies haven't gotten into hypersonics, more space hold, companies. Hold lower. Oh, lower? Just okay, there we go. Hand a little lower. Cool. All right. No, your, hands, like... your actual hand. There you go. You okay. <laughs> it was feedbacking a little. Uh, okay, all right, all right. Um, so I was going to say, I'm surprised that more space companies have not gotten into hypersonics because. Uh, like Peter was saying, it's so close, the applicability is right there. And I actually thought that more defense companies would have gotten in because they're building these missiles. And historically, you look at the industry, missile providers made the jump to being launch services providers. Um, I don't have any questions right now. I know you put me on the spot, but I'll just say, you know, defense is a big area. Um, you know, maybe one, if I'm going to just off the, off the cuff, uh, you know, I think the defense sector is often being looked at as a, a dependable anchor customer. I'm curious how you two approach that market. You know, Peter, I think you've got a lot of commercial customers on the launch side, but, you know, what's your value proposition to DOD? And then for Redwire, you know, you focused a lot on civil space. Uh, and now you've expanded into Europe, and your your annual report you highlight ESA's growing budget. Where do you see defense applications for Redwire? So I mean, our, our manifest is fifty. Our launch manifest is fifty fifty. So fifty percent commercial, fifty percent government. Um, you know, we're one of three suppliers of launch to the NRO. So the SpaceX, ULA, and us um, launch for the NRO. So it's a, it's a real core part of our business. And then if we look at our customers, um, a lot of our customers that, that fly an Electron are also you know, servicing the US government in, in defense in one way or the other. And then on the space system side, um, you know, obviously we have, uh, you know, we have probably a lot more commercial with respect to Constellation builds with the, with the, um, the Global Star contract and, and VADA and, and all the rest of it. But we still also have some, you know, some government stuff with the Mars missions. Uh, but across our kind of portfolio of, of uh, you know, of systems and, you know, we do a lot in the defense sector and a lot in the government. So we kind of like the 50-50 model. I think, it's, I think it's good. We kind of, we kind of joke that, um, you know, our, our government customers always pay their bills on time but never turn up on time. <laughs> and, our, you know, commercial customers always turn up on time but never pay their bills on time. So it kind of all, you know, all, all evens itself out. So for Redwire, we actually don't talk that much about our national security customer base. It is last year the fastest growing customer base. It is a very, um, let's just call it warfighter domain that has a number of very high bars to entry. So if I look at what Redwire does and what we, how we built it, we built it for the civil, commercial, and obviously that national security warfighter. For obvious reasons, we don't talk about the warfighter uh, domain all that much, but if you look at our financials, it is the fastest growing piece of our business because if you look at our enabling these space missions with power, with anything associated with communications, any deployable sensors, all of that is war fighting domain. The key to that high barrier to entry in the US is you have to have the facilities, the people, the systems in place 
to work for that very high national security standard. Um, and again, without getting too much into it, because we generally don't, this is a very high growth area for us, given the, uh, in essence, competition that we have with China, but also the same type of sensors. The thing I always want to mention with national security, having been an Air Force uh, aviator and somebody who worked a lot in electronic warfare, a lot of the same things you do for that national security customer, sensors, can be used for climate change. The same thing that you can do for communications, you can also then bring over to uh, the civilian and commercial side. We separate our business from a consumer standpoint to civilian, co commercial, and then obviously national security. But that, that war fighting customer is a big part of the red wire differentiation because many companies that have a European arm actually don't have the security infrastructure to serve that war fighter, and we do. Um, in terms of investing in new projects, um, you, you know, both public companies now, so I'm curious to hear if things have changed in that era, especially on the Rocket Lab side. Uh, you know, you've got Neutron that you're developing quite a bit. There's the Venus ambitions as well, and everything else that's going on on, on the uh, satellite bus side that you mentioned with uh, Escapade, right, is yep. a uh, photon bus and all that. In terms of putting money towards these big projects, yep. is it different now, being public and, and deciding that that's an initiative that you want to take on and, and figuring out how to go about that? Not really for us. I mean, if you look at our history, we've always, always been extremely disciplined on capital allocation. And if you look at the, the amount of capital it took us to get, uh, like, Electron to the pad, it, it was, you know, hundred and something million dollars to, to get a electron to the pad and the pad built. So we've always been very, very, you know, careful custodians of capital and uh, we, we get a lot done on, on the dollar. So um, that, that doesn't, that ethos hasn't really changed. As, as a public company, we were, you know, it's, it's, it's the same, right? Um, so we always had really, really strong financial discipline. And the projects that we choose to invest in are ones that, we, that we're confident are going to drive real growth in the future. And I mean, the biggest thing we're investing in is Neutron, right? That is, that is you know, if we, took, if we took Neutron out of the equation, then Rocket Lab is, is a profitable company. You put it back in and then, you know, rockets just suck down cash. Um, but uh, the flip side to that is that um, we believe that the opportunity and, and the growth that's going to come from that Neutron vehicle is, is, is well worth it. And in these times... Uh, the companies that are going to be successful and survive are going to be the companies that are very disciplined with their capital. And uh, we've come from a market in a time where I'm, I'm, I'm old too. So I, I can, I'm old too. So I, I can remember stomping Silicon Valley trying to raise $5 million. And $5 million was an extraordinary amount of money to put into a rocket company. That was crazy. And uh, you know, we, we ended up in a time that was just completely dislocated. We saw funding rounds in the billions, or you know, hundreds of millions, completely dislocated from reality. And uh, and and as a result, you know, not a really good, not not really good financial discipline across a lot of the sector. I would say, with lots of opportunities to do cool stuff, but just huge amount of huge amount of money spent for for kind of. I would say pretty average return on on kind of development milestones and, and things, and um, we're in a different time now, and I don't mind it because we've always been really disciplined with our capital. But for those who have not been disciplined with their capital, um, this is the time that we we sort out the real companies from the from the not so real companies, and I think that's needed within the industry. Yeah, and certainly, at, you know, competitors in the range are all growing their sizes of their vehicles as well um, to different points. So a thing I'm going to pick your brain about is that I've started to feel like Neutron is a little small. And I'm curious how you're feeling about it these days, size-wise. And beware, I'm going to make Caleb give me some numbers in a sure. minute. So start thinking. On, on what, so you know, th yeah. this is a comment that I've had ever since we started Electron. And all I will say is it's not the size of your rocket that counts. It's like there is, there is much, much more to it than that. And uh, when we first started with Electron, people would say the same thing. Uh, and, uh, but guess what? It's actually, it fills the market niche, you know, we would argue perfectly. And um, we think Neutron is, is, a, is a really interesting, you know, op really interesting market size for the kinds of projects that, that we think we want to go after and the, the kinds of projects that we think are going to be profitable and valuable. Um, now, in saying that, uh, you know, it's an eight meter diameter vehicle. There's plenty of room for growth. So, well, and that's the whole thing is that I, I mentioned this the other day that uh, knowing your history, even Electron had payload growth yeah. over its lifetime. So, compared to the other competitors out there, I trust that you are able to grow the payload range of your vehicles 
more than the others have been able to hit the actual promised payload range of their vehicles that are out there. So yeah. it is interesting. And then also the other aspect is like it's not Neutron is probably not the last vehicle you're ever going to build if everything goes well. So yeah, look, is that to consider? Well, I'm not, well. not going to promise anything like that. Eat another hat. Is yeah, all no, no yeah. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> what are you eating this time? But I mean, you, you have to in, in 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 the kind of the spirit of being capital efficient. What I think a lot of people don't realize is the the actual rocket, the building, the, the developing of the rocket, is the cheapest bit. Like the if you if you look at the cost of a rocket program, it's almost to the cubed, the cost of the money that you have to expend on infrastructure. So if you if you're going to spend. Five hundred million dollars developing a rocket. You got to spend like billions by the time you build your VAB, your pad, your integration facility, your factory, and all of those sorts of things. And this is what I think a lot of people don't realize: like the the, the cost of a rocket development program is the is by far the cheapest piece, and it's the easiest piece. I mean, I think it, I think of Electron, um, the first rocket I thought was going to be the hardest. What well, turns out, rocket number twenty was the hardest. Because by the time you're at Rocket 20, you've got a complete factory, you're relying completely on ERP systems, MRP systems, and a technician with a set of work instructions, and it's got to work every time. So, you know, the, the, the expenditure in building a rocket program is not the rocket. It's all the other stuff that goes around it. On the, on the payload side, though, and the constellations uh, is something that you called out early on of being a market for Neutron. Um, how many constellations of thousands are there going to be? Because I kind of feel like at some point we're going to run out of companies having either the money or real estate to deploy thousands of satellites. And that's another aspect of this math is like, what are the constellation sizes that Neutron is going to be well targeted for in, in your mind? Yeah. Uh, so right now we're tracking about eight different mega constellations. And for that threshold, I'm saying anything that's over about 100. Um, so not thousands and thousands. Uh, I, I don't do math in public, so I'm not going to try and... <laughs> Even if it's simple, I won't try to figure it out. But, you know, there's eight, and I'd say the number keeps growing uh, because of geopolitical interests. So, you know, there was a time when, you know, the question at conferences like this were, how many mega constellations are going to make it? And everyone would say, oh, the market can support two, maybe three. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. Um, well, it does matter, but like it's not, that's not going to be the thing that decides it. The military, the Space Development Agency, decided that they want one. Both of these companies are involved in that constellation. SpaceX has theirs. Bezos decided he wants one. Um, Russia has talked about one. I don't know if it'll ever actually happen. It's kind of like Angara. You know, it comes up every few years and then, you know. Um, but you, you're going to see you know, lots of different systems that are going to come up. You know, I think the interesting thing for, for both of these companies is that the evolution of spacecraft is something that has changed very rapidly over the past few years to the point where launch vehicles have to keep evolving. You know, if you look back at when, when Geo was king, um, Companies, Ariane, Proton, you know, even early Falcon, they all increased the size of their vehicle. This is not unique to small vehicles, and it's because they were trying to chase increasingly bigger geostationary satellites. Now we've seen the same thing with small spacecraft, and uh, who knows where the future trend is going to be, because you've got digitization of payloads that has taken out a lot of the hardware. It's made the Geo smaller again. I'm wondering if it'll make the Leo smaller again at one point. Um, it's really curious to, to watch these details, and you know, maybe if I can piggyback off of that and then throw a question at these guys. Um, you know, for, for Peter, you're building the satellites for Global Star with MBA. Uh, those are about 500 kilograms each. You know, so for pro this surprised me because that's too big to fit on Electron. Maybe you had Neutron in mind already, but um, what's the what's the thought process for you? Not only in determining the size of a rocket, but how you go after spacecraft classes. Are you going to keep going up, down, CubeSat, Geo? And then for Redwire, you don't build full satellites, but you build all the inside, if I have it right. Uh, you, OK, that's wrong. Tell me about wh how do you define? We do, we, I mean, the truth is we, we are the picks and shovels. We are the mm -hmm. enabler of all these satellites and provide the critical components. However, with our Space NV acquisition, we have the Proba, so we actually now got into it. But I would say it's not necessarily a mainline business yet, but we are seeing demand for that, um, especially given that we actually have a ton of infrastructure that can make that better. It's a synergy, right? But I don't want to overpromise. I mean, this industry is built on overpromising and overdelivering. I'd like it to be built on overpromising and overdelivering, right? And that's. But I, I would just to let Peter answer. I think a more relevant question for us. From our standpoint, we, we believe really what Electron and Neutron can do 
is just get more of the low Earth orbit economy, whether it be the national security part of it, the commercialization part of it. It is so, look, again, people aren't walking around here, you know, just looking around, taking pictures. They are, there's business to be done, and that's what, that's what Peter's going to be able to enable. Then Redwire's space systems and our payloads then, then take it to the next level. Um, but you don't have to create a satellite to get the business. And I, I, that's why I'm, I'm impressed by how people are now gravitating towards a business model of space systems, which, again, Redwire's, that's our foundation. Because, again, that's where a lot of the money needs to go to be able to make the space economy work. And I, I think I'd, I'd answer your, your question with, um, think a little bit bigger. So the endpoint for Rocket Lab is not a merchant launch provider. It's not a satellite bus builder. The endpoint for Rocket Lab is something much bigger. So as we look at as we look at how we grow the company, and if you look at like our, our satellite systems acquisitions, like solar, as you know, like longest lead time, really expensive. That bit needs to be solved. So we went and acquired a solar company, and then you know software and and all the the, the you know reaction wheels and Star Trek, all the, the kind of the fundamentals. And then you take it up a, one level higher. It's like well. You know, if, if we're going to launch our own stuff one day, obviously we have a thesis on what we think is going to be the ideal size to do that. And we might be wrong, we might be right, we'll, we'll see. We think the vehicle is, is in, a, in a sweet spot for a, a lot of the commercial constellations. Um, and, you know, the trouble is if you build a really big rocket that can do everything, then it doesn't do the middle class really well at all. Um, so at some point you have to kind of split the hairs and saying, well, where, where is where is like where's the, the, the peak in the bell curve, and um, when we look at the you know the constellations that are out there and what's going on, we think we've chosen the peak of the bell curve, and then if you want to think bigger, if you think about well what what we might want to do in the future, obviously that's driving to some of the decisions around launch vehicle class. But I reserve the right to be wrong at all times. For sure, yeah, as always. Um, on the launch side, there's something interesting happening, which is this next round of the National Security Space Launch Program. Uh, and there's these two lanes now where uh, Electron and Neutron fit really well in the, in the new one that's more task order based, more like uh, something like Eclipse program. Um, I'd love to just hear your view on, on how that went. And uh, I know there were some things that you were hoping to see that, that maybe some of the missions from lane two would make their way over to lane one to give you more of an edge for Neutron there. But um, do you feel like that's settled out in a good spot or is there still some tweaks that you'd like to see as they make as you close in on that actual uh, contracting round you know we're really happy i mean this is this is what um you know the solution that's been driven to here is is what we 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 thought was the best solution i mean the nation needs like absolute assurance assurity around launch you need diversity in suppliers so keeping that that kind of lane two together uh and 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 in one piece is, is you have to do that no matter what but the, the opportunity for the nation to use uh, new capabilities and the opportunity for the industrial base to, to both grow at the same time, it's very symbiotic. But you have to create those, those opportunities and that lane one really, really does that. And um, Electron is not, not, not you know, qualifiable because it's a 10 ton you know, sort of cut off on, on that. But, um, but no, we're, we're, we're very, very happy with and I think, um, I think uh, you know, NSSL have done a really good job at, at kind of threading the needle between an assuring you know, space access for, for the country, but also um, stimulating and helping grow in the industrial base, but also not lowering the bar so low that like, um, you know, PowerPoint companies can get in there and run amok. Which we've seen with clips to some extent. Uh, I am interested to pick your brains on the lunar surface side of things, right? We've talked a lot about launch, a lot about orbit. Um, I'm looking at a picture of these arrays that are up on station, but uh, I saw them in a mock-up on top of an astrobotic that vehicle. That is exactly right. Yeah, so you're, you're extending some of the component work that you're doing down to the lunar surface. A lot of companies are looking at putting infrastructure to support Artemis or Eclipse or something like that. Um, solar arrays are obvious one. Is there other areas of that business that you're looking at taking what you do now in orbit for satellites and looking at surface assets in that way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at a number of things that we're all trying to do in a space system environment, the key is how do you bring that to explore, live, and work in space. For us, obviously, one of our primary is the roll-on, the ROSA, which rolls off or rolls up and rolls down on the lunar surface. And that's, that's what you saw. You can roll it anyway. But that is particularly important on the moon because you need to protect the actual solar panels. And this allows you know, to have a more sustainable power source 
Um, and so that's a big part. But also there's antennas, other types of deployables, sensors for us, cameras. If you really look at what the moon has to do, and Bridenstine said it yesterday, the, the camera is the mission. Because in order for us to create the next, you know, kind of, you know, well before, well after I'm gone, is people need to record what we're doing there to create that excitement. As, as Jim said, when he was a young guy, you had the Challenger. That's what people remember. I want to get back to, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, when you, when you basically could see us landing on the moon. That's what, so the camera piece of this, which is a big part of what Redwire does, not just with our sensors, is another area um, where we're on the lunar. We were on Artemis, as you know, we provide the eyes of Orion. Those are our cameras. But we plan on doing that on the lunar surface, too, um, as part of a, a, a full, you know, kind of space system. And then we'll also put payloads, because there's a lot of commercial activity that's going to happen on the moon. Exactly why I bring it up, because it's, it's a different part of the market that um, y we can argue about, are there customers for Clips payloads? Is there going to be a business case that closes for spacesuits to walk on the moon? But from like a component section, like there's a lot of stuff going on on the moon, in orbit of the moon, on the moon. Uh, so it's, it's, as component suppliers, it's interesting to, to look at that. I don't know if there's anything from the space system side that, that you're looking at as a lunar surface asset or... Obviously, you have planetary ambitions generally, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. when not, it not, comes not to surface stuff, I'd be curious. Not, not so much on the surface stuff, other than um, perhaps in, in the solar business. I mean, um, I love nothing more than tour touring the, you know, the Albuquerque factory and seeing the Mars solar panels that are specifically designed for the wavelengths on the Martian surface. Like, there's nothing cooler than that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, the, the kind of cislunar economy is going to be interesting to see how it develops. I think there's going to need to be a... Uh, a, a really robust capital market that's that's very buoyant on it, um, you know, for, for for a while to kind of get it there. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. When you say cap Sorry, when you say capital market, what do you what do you mean to to fund it or to actually be part of the economy? See, I think when I look at a cap, when I look at an economy on the moon and the commodities that are there, there's got to be a capital market to be able to for regolith. I mean, I think you could do all kinds of very interesting economic activity on the moon, take it back terrestrially, and create, in essence, different business models. It doesn't have to all just be about um, you know, exploration. There's a lot of things that can happen on the moon that, frankly, could get sold on Earth. Um, and I, we, we haven't really, until, until we're there, um, in a more permanent way, we're not going to know what that is. But there's whole industries in the ocean floor that are becoming, I mean, there's a lot of uh, analogies of what we're doing on the ocean floor now that we that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago um, that now, you know, we can do on the moon also. Co has to come down the cost curve, obviously. How much of that do you dig into? Because I, I know the kinds of stuff that you read, these investor decks or, uh, you know, you always get your hands on something interesting to look at from these companies' internals. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at any given company and you see, like, the way that, you know, the way that we talked about, even with the hypersonics, uh, seeing what their current market is and finding that niche that's, like, just slightly outside their bounds... Um, when it comes to stuff out towards the moon, is this hitting your radar yet in terms of like the, the quilty space view of things? Or are you still focused more on, on uh, the closer to Earth kind of stuff? I still focus mainly on the closer to Earth stuff because that's where money is made, mainly. Um, but we are paying more attention to it. You know, sometimes when I, when I think about the moon, you're right, you know, exploration is a driver. There's been talk for eons of tourism as a driver. It hasn't really materialized intensely yet. It's starting. Um, I, I kind of think of it, you know, in, in, in a couple of different buckets. You know, there's the exploration one. Uh, there's commercial opportunities, which we're really hopeful about in the future. And then there's the, the DOD opportunity, which, um, you know, frankly, there's a lot of concern uh, on DOD level about, uh, I would describe it as the opportunity cost of the moon. You know, we don't know what the future entails on the moon today. But it's kind of like, you know, if I said that there was a box at the end of the show floor, and it could have $10 in it, but it could have a million. Like everybody is going to run there because the million dollars is really enticing. And so when you talk about what's the future for the moon, you know, we talk about regolith, we talk about water on the ice, you know, water on the, on the poles and all these things. But the truth is there's an opportunity cost there for getting to the moon. And so there's a desire to have U.S. industry there first so that when we actually realize what that is, uh, that it comes to, to American businesses. So I'm watching it. You know, I'm, I'm excited to see NASA kind of seeding the cislunar economy 
you know, buying services from private industry and helping to facilitate that market. I'm glad that they're not just doing it entirely themselves. And I'm hopeful that there's an industry there. Uh, I'm hoping, hopeful that there's a future, but I don't quite know what it is yet. As does everybody. That's like the thing right now. But, but we, do, we do know there's analogies to that. When there, there are industries that have come up. I, I always look at the surface of the ocean. What we do on the surface of the ocean, which doesn't get a lot of play, there isn't the conference for the surface of the ocean, but when you look at what's happening um, in terms of just metals, mining, but also other areas of tourism, it's, it's higher growth than you think, and they didn't even think of that you know, 20 years ago. So I, I'm, I'm more optimistic that we'll figure it out. We just gotta stay there a bit longer. First, we gotta get there. One thing I've seen talk of this week is that um, as companies are going to go up to raise some more funding for additional runway or whatever, they might have to take down rounds that bring their valuation down a bit. And thought being that if that happens, in some cases, we might see more acquisitions. You haven't bought anyone recently, but are you going shopping anytime soon? It's an interesting time because it's, it's both a good, a good time. Um, I, I'm not sure what you found, but the, the private company valuations seem to stay high for really, they're, they're starting to kind of realign, but as public market valuations are dropping, the private stuff sort of just seemed to hold its ground. But I think, um, you know, the, the burn, the economic burn is kind of lasting long enough to see that. So it's kind of a, a great time to do stuff because um, there's lots of opportunities at a more affordable price. It's also a terrible time to do stuff because if you need to, if you need to raise equity to go and do that, then that's also, a, it's also, it's also a, you know, a, a tough market to do it in. He's avoiding the shopping question. <laughs> He's not talking about it. So, who yeah. would he go shopping for? If he was going to go shopping, who would he go shopping for? I mean, there's a launch company on sale. It's <laughs> a couple yeah. of them, I think. I, I said that purely <laughs> for facial and reactions. It, it, it is a good, uh, it's a good market for hypersonics if you've got a plane already. So, you know, that's the thing. I mean, I, I would agree with Peter. I'm always amazed. You know, M&A generally doesn't sometimes follow the market. You'd think in a market where everybody's generally pricing themselves off the public comps or comparables, you'd think, like, great time to buy companies. It's really about CEO confidence. CEO and founder confidence. And right now, that confidence isn't very high. You've seen $26 billion lost, or at least come down, in the companies that went public. All of us, all together, since the time we went public to today's trading value, $26 billion. It's come up, too, in the last couple of months. And so if you're going to give equity as part of your security to buy a company, which was Redwire's you know, mission, is to keep these uh, owner founders as part of Redwire, um, you know, to do that, there needs to be a level of confidence, and we're just going to have to get down the road a little bit between the two words I would stick with everybody in this room, staying power. Who has staying power? Staying power is going to determine who's going to be acquired or partnered with, because we view it as a partnership, and who's, who's just going to fall away. So, so I'll, I'll add, just from the, the finance you know, perspective, um, I know that there are companies that are being looked at for, there are people that are shopping around, and it's because prices have gone so low, you know, kind of like what Peter was saying, both private and public. Um, I, there, you know, we, we can look at a, the, the Virgin Orbit bankruptcy, you know, I was surprised that one of the things they said is as soon as their IPO was done, they almost immediately went to market to try and sell themselves. You know, they were, they were being proactive about it, there are others that are going to end up being reactive because people are going to look and say, hey, this is a price that is much, much lower and they've got assets that they may not be able to fully you know, exploit or utilize. And that creates M&A opportunities. But uh, it really comes down to what is a company trying to accomplish through that M&A? You know, you kind of look at, at these two panelists. And so for Rocket Lab, they decided they wanted to be more of a, a space company or a full full you know, space company. You know, Peter's said it should have been uh, Space Labs, not Rocket Labs. You said that at some point. And Redwire, you've consolidated a lot in the, in the middle. So you've become this kind of powerful integrator supplier company. Uh, you know, future M&A, you know, I, I'd say, you know, it's, it's hard to read the tea leaves as to what's going to actually happen. But you can look at companies, you know, are they trying to tap into new geographic markets? Are they trying to vertically integrate certain capabilities? Uh, are they trying to achieve scale? You know, these are the kinds of, of, of factors that uh, precipitate M&A. And, you know, right now we are in a less uh, risk tolerant environment for both investment and M&A. But uh, companies are, are shrewd. They always want to be opportunistic about that. And so you know, we've seen certainly a dip from the 2021 levels, at least at Quilty, from what we're tracking. Uh, there's not as much M&A, but that was a pretty frenetic 
level. So I, I wouldn't describe it as something you're concerned about. It's more just people have chilled out a little bit and they're still they're they're shopping, but they're not shopping like they've you know won the lottery. It's not Black Friday. It's not Black <laughs> Friday anymore. It isn't also, but everything in capital allocation is what's your alternative. And there's a lot of organic growth, a lot of organic growth. I I, I don't know the specifics for Rocket Lab, but we've seen a a doubling. We have almost half a billion of backlog, and and a lot of that's contracted. Over half of it's contracted. So. We started last year well below that, so we actually have a lot of growth that we can we can execute in 23 and 24 just by getting up every day and and execution excellence, right? All right. Well, I think we're out of time here, so thank you all so much for for hanging out with me. It's been fun to pick a brain and uh, figure out if neutrons the right size. It's been keeping me up, so it was good to hash it out. Uh, I'm excited to see it. You know, we're drove by the tent when we were down there, so we're excited for that. Um, maybe to, to just finish up, like, what are the for each of you, the next big thing we should be watching for from, from Redwire, from Rocket Lab? I mean, so for us, we're really excited about a number of launches that have our payloads in the next number of months. So when we look at, and some of them we can't talk about, but some we can talk about, especially in payloads that are, um, you know, bio, our, our bio facility. Um, I've got our patch dealing with agriculture. We're going to get more, more seeds and more plants up there for sustainability. So when I look at what I'm excited about, I'm totally excited. I've got the guys here selling power units and, and uh, components on sensors. But when I look at really improving life on Earth, I look at the type of uh, payloads that we're launching in the next six months. I mean, the, the easy thing that everyone grapples on for us is, is neutron development. Um, and uh, that's going well. And you'll see, you'll, you'll see the, some, some milestones come through and, and all the usual stuff you'll expect to see. But I guess... The, the wild card really within Rocket Lab is the space systems business. And um, if I'm watching, if I'm an external person watching the company, neutrons are given. It's just going to happen. We know how to build rockets. Like, we're good at that. So that, that's going to happen. Um, but I think the, the more interesting thing will be to follow the space systems group because I think there's, uh, there's some, some really good stuff cooking there. I'll finish because that vote for both of us, that's going to lead to better financial performance too. I don't want, I mean, I'm the CFO of the business, so... I think we're going to see better financial performance out of our businesses. And, and that's what I'll be watching for as a financial analyst. I'll <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. Speak nothing less. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all so much. I do want to shout out Redwire for having us here at the booth. Uh, this is the last Miko show. I've got Off Nominal coming up. The beer's coming out, I see, over there. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, it, you know, the seven years ago tomorrow is the first episode of Miko that I put up. So uh, it's cool to have a little birthday party for the podcast here. Uh, with everybody on stage. So thanks all of you for showing up. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. And uh, it's been a blast. Thanks.